So hi everyone. Today we'll learn on um, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, the current evidence, how the practice has changed over the years, and what is the current context of managing this important problem in preterm infants. So bronchopulmonary dysplasia, we'll learn about the definition, the pathophysiology, and then we look at the pathology. And since it's an evolving disease, we look at the prevention and management together. Uh, we can divide this into three phases. The early phase, that is in the first seven days after birth. The evolving phase from seven days to 36 weeks. And after we define bronchopulmonary dysplasia 36 weeks, that is the established phase, we'll look at the management. We'll also look at some normal th novel therapies which are coming up in the management of this most important problem in extreme preterm and very preterm infants. Coming to the definition, yeah, the definition has been evolving. Uh, initially, it was more of a respiratory pathology leading to clinical respiratory distress, uh, ventilation need with X-ray findings suggestive of hyperinflated bubbly pattern, and then the histological changes. Later, oxygen dependency at 30 days was defined as bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And then this was changed to oxygen dependence, dependency at 36 weeks of corrected gestational age or a postmenstrual age. Now in 2001, the clear-cut definition came and most of the people started using the research studies. So this definition was, the first criteria was the baby should be requiring oxygen for first 28 days after birth. And then you can divide them into mild, moderate and severe at 36 weeks of PMA. Those babies who are on room air are mild BPD. Those on oxygen less than 30% are moderate BPD. And those on oxygen more than 30% and or on CPAP or on invasive ventilation were considered to have severe BPD. So again, babies that less than 32 weeks were evaluated at uh, 36 weeks of PMA. And those more than 32 weeks were evaluated at uh, during a day of life of 36 day, 56 days or at discharge. Since this was based on the oxygen requirement at uh, 36 weeks, some people felt there should be a physiological definition. And in the physiological definition, you can see here that those babies who require uh, ventilation or CPAP and having and or having FIO2 requirement 30% were considered to have BPD. But those less than 30%, there was a need for doing physiological um, oxygen need challenge. And here, if the baby's oxygen requirement was less than 30%, the baby was gradually weaned off from oxygen. And the baby's saturation should be between if the saturations were um, consistently more than 90% for 30 minutes after weaning off from oxygen, the baby was considered to be not having oxygen dependency. But if the saturation fell less than 90% during this 30-minute time, the baby was considered to have oxygen dependency. So, but none of this... Uh, definitions were useful in predicting the long-term outcome of uh, newborn babies or preterm babies who are defined as having BPD. So then uh, the NIH came up with a consensus statement of 2018, where BPD was defined as the oxygen dependency. Uh, BPD was defined at uh, 36 weeks of corrected age or PMA. And the baby need to be on respiratory support for more than three consecutive days and maintaining saturation between 90 to 95 percent. So baby should be at 36 weeks of PMA, the baby should be on oxygen or respiratory support for at least three days. And this was again graded into grade one, grade two, grade three, based on the respiratory support and oxygen requirement. Babies who were on intermittent mandatory ventilation were graded into two or three based on the FIO2 requirement. Grade 2, if they were on IMV and FIO2 was 21%. And grade 3, if the baby was on mechanical ventilation, FIO2 was more than 21%. Babies on non-invasive respiratory support were graded as 1, 2, 3. Grade 1 and 21, grade 2 and 21 to 30%. And grade 3, more than 30% FIO2. Those on low flow oxygen and nasal cannula were again divided into only grade 1 and grade 2. So there was a special grade of grade 3A, which was given to babies who died after the first 14 days of 
birth, but less than 36 weeks and because of respiratory failure. So that is babies died on the ventilator, but after two weeks or less than 36 weeks. And this definition was used for as a criteria for 3A criteria. Now, Jensen came up with a large cohort study where he evaluated what can actually predict the long-term outcome. And based on the Jensen study, the current definition is evolved into grade 1, grade 2, grade 3. Uh, that is the baby's uh, respiratory support at 36 weeks is taken into consideration. And in grade 1, the baby is on only nasal flow oxygen or low flow oxygen. Grade 2, the baby is only on non-invasive respiratory support and grade 3 baby is on mechanical ventilation. Here we don't have the oxygen oxygen dependency as a criteria. We are just talking about the mode of respiratory support. And this is considered to be one important way to predict the long-term uh, pulmonary and neuromorbidities. Now, second thing, the pathophysiology. We all know that PPD occurs in babies who are uh, extreme preterm and very preterm infants, mostly in babies with, born between 24 to 32 weeks of gestation. And when it occurs in younger or the extreme preterm, we call it as new PPD. This is nothing but the alveolar arrest happens in the canalicular phase or early secular phase. The BPD which occurs in slightly older preterms, that is around 20, 30, 28 to 31 weeks, or little more than that, is usually in the secular phase. And this occurs mostly because of oxygen toxicity, ventilator requirement, or because of pulmonary fluids and infections. And this is considered to be the old BPD. Now, which babies in preterm get to BPD? So we have a perinatal and we have postnatal risk factors. So perinatal risk factors includes infections, IUGR, asphyxia, not giving antenatal steroids, and then genetic predisposition. In the postnatal period, those babies who are exposed to high oxygen, high ventilatory requirements, those who have infections, and those who have pulmonary overload due to hemodynamically significant PDA and those with nutritional deficiencies or babies who are not growing well are the babies at risk of having BPD. So BPD is basically preterm disease and often associated with infections, asphyxia, inflammation, oxygen toxicity and nutritional deficiencies. So pathology wise, BPD is mostly a disease which can affect the alveoli, the blood vessels and the airways. You can see here in the alveoli, there could be alveolar arrest or damage to the epithelium and inflammatory response, which is seen in the alveoli. Or it could be problem with the blood vessels surrounding the alveoli, which could be abnormal development or vascular overgrowth or fibrosis, and that can lead to pulmonary hypertension. The third pathological finding is the in the airways, there could be bronchoconstriction or they could be hypertrophy of the airways leading to fibrosis and then difficulty in ventilation due to increased resistance and thereby CO2 retention and hyperinflation of the lungs. So basically BPD involves the alveoli, the airways and the blood vessels. In the blood vessels, it can lead to pulmonary hypertension or VQ mismatch. In the alveolar, it can lead to decreased surface area. And in the airways, it can lead to increased resistance and also lot of VQ, VQ mismatch because of hyperinflation and air traffic. Now, since it's an evolving disease, it can start from birth or prenatally and go up to 36 weeks. We have to divide the management as well as the prevention into three phases. Let us first talk about the first seven days. And obviously the maximum in insult occurs in the labor room or in the first one hour after birth. And we need to go all out to prevent this damage in the first one hour. So in the babies who require supplemental oxygen or resuscitation, we should ensure that at birth, the saturation target should be 80% uh, at five minutes after birth. So even if the babies look blue, we should not be worried because the saturation target is only 80% at five minutes. So we need to titrate the FIO2 to get to 80% by five minutes and don't aim for a pink baby within this time. And if possible, baby should be on started on early CPAP, especially those babies who have start having respiratory distress, we start early rescue CPAP at a peep of 5 and FIO2 titrated to maintain the saturation between 91 to 95%. And it is also good 
to start and give early surfactant in the labor room or at admission to Nidiniku so that the surfactant spread is best when the lung fluid is still there in the alveoli and the alveoli is still open with the lung fluid. And if surfactant is given, it may be better to be given by least, inv uh, least invasive surfactant administration, that is LISA technique. The difference between LISA and Ensure is, in LISA, the baby is spontaneous breathing and no artificial breath is given at the time of surfactant administration. Whereas in Ensure, you intubate, give surfactant, and also do the positive pressure ventilation while giving surfactant. Whereas when you're doing LISA, the baby is on CPAP, you pass a small catheter, give surfactant while the CPAP is still ongoing. So coming to the NICU phase or the early seven days in the NICU, the other things which can help you to prevent or to uh, prevent the baby from evolving into BPDR, giving early caffeine, the earlier the caffeine is given, the lower the risk of PPD for the baby. Fluid restriction always work on lower volume of fluid for all these babies. And the total enteral and parental nutrition should be on the lower side of the need for the baby. And early surfactant, we have already discussed. If not given in the labor room, we should give for all babies who are on CPAP and requiring a PEEP of more than 6 and or FIO2 more than 30%. And if surfactant is given, preferable to give by LISA. And if LISA technique is difficult or if the people are not experienced, one can still go with insure technique. And if vitamin A is given, it is better to be given early in the first four weeks. And vitamin A best is given IM, 5000 international units, three times a day. And the number needed to treat is 14, which means every 14 babies we give vitamin K, we can avoid one BPD. The other things which can happen in the early phase, which will prevent BPD are ventilation strategy and selective use of steroids. And in the first one week, the recommended steroid is only hydrocortisone. We'll discuss about this in the next subsequent slide. Now, nutrition is the pivotal, nutrition has the pivotal role in, in decreasing the incidence and severity of BPD, both during early phase, evolving phase, and also during the established phase. And this nutrition in the first week is mostly related to an aggressive enteral and parental nutrition and concentrating on giving more of mother's own milk or human milk. In the early phase, that is in the first seven days, the ventilation strategies adopted should be volume targeted ventilation and try to extubate the baby to non-invasive ventilation if the baby is on invasive as early as possible to NIPPV, CPAP or HFNC. Those babies who are off invasive ventilation before seven days are less likely to have BPD. And if you're ventilating the babies on invasive, the tidal volume should, targeting should be between four to six ml per kg. So short TIs, 0.3 to 0.4 seconds and lower rates of 40 to 60 per minute. We should try to give lesser pressures, that is a PIP of 14 to 20 and a PIP of 4 to 6. These are recommended to prevent alveolar damage due to volume trauma. And our target PO2s can be on the lower side. That is, there could be little permissive hypoxia and permissive hypercapnia, keeping the pH in the normal range, and that is above 7.25. And PO2 should be between 40 to 60 mm of mercury and PCO2 between 45 to 55 mm of mercury. So these are the ventilation strategies we should evolve, we should adopt during the early phase. Now coming to the steroids, in the early phase, it's recommended, the only recommended steroid is low dose, low dose hydrocortisone. And this is very, very selectively used. And the dose of hydrocortisone is from the Primilog study, cumulative dose of 8.5 milligrams given over 10 days. And... Uh, we are looking at improved BPD, BPD free survival. It is known to decrease, uh, increase the BPD free survival, um, low dose hydrocortisone. But in the Primilog study, the, it has been clearly shown that it can increase the risk of having spontaneous intestinal perfection, perfe perforation if given with indomethacine. And there is also increased risk of late onset sepsis, especially when administered to babies less than 26 weeks. However, the best benefits with hydrocortisone are for babies who are less than 28, 26 weeks and with a history of clinical choreomyelitis in the mother. So this is rarely used and sparingly used because it is associated with increased risk of SIP and LOS, although it can decrease the risk of having BPD. The other steroids which have been studied are the inhaled budesonide with surfactant. Uh, this has definitely shown to increase the BPD-free survival rate and the number needed to treat is very good. That is, every four babies given uh, 
BDC net and surfactant, you can avoid one BPD. However, the long-term effects are not yet evaluated with this uh, method and still it is experimental. Now coming to the second part of the management uh, of extreme preterms and very preterm babies to prevent BPT, that is the evolving phase. They start from seven days and goes up to 36 weeks. And as we define BPD at 36 weeks, this is the evolving phase. And during this phase, every effort should be there to prevent baby going from the normal lung growth to a BPD growth. So here continue caffeine and caffeine across the early and evolving phase has shown to decrease the incidence and severity of BPD. And again, continue to follow the restrictive fluid regime. And the ventilatory strategies are slightly different here. And again, all efforts should be made to convert the baby from invasive to non-invasive, especially CPAP, nasal IMB or synchronized NIPPB. Here, our targets are pH should be 7.25 to 7.35. And you can see that we need to maintain slightly higher PAO2s, that is 50 to 70 mm. And we can we can target slightly higher PCO2s of 50 to 60 mm of mercury to prevent volume and barotrauma to the lungs. And after one week, it is the steroid, which if it used, should be only dexamethasone, could be low or high dose. And this should be again used only on a rescue mode and in only select babies. We'll discuss about this in the subsequent slides. And again, during the evolution phase, our aim should be focusing on enteral nutrition and again on mother's own milk, using mother's own milk as much as possible. So in the second phase, that is the evolving phase, the only steroid which is recommended is dexamethasone. We know the DART trial. In the DART trial, the dose use was 0.89 milligram per kg, given over a duration of 10 days, and that is a cumulative dose. And this has significantly shown to decrease the extubation failure rate. That is the babies where we were able to take out the babies from ventilation to CPAP or NAB. So it was possible and it was successful using low dose dexamethasone. So in babies who are stuck to ventilator, this may be one option. However, it has not shown to decrease the incidence of BPD in the trial, probably because the sample size was low. Now in the other regimen which has been evaluated is the high dose dexamethasone, which is given in the dose of 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg per day. This is definitely shown to decrease the risk of BPD, but there is an increased risk of neurodevelopmental delay as well as cerebral palsy with high dose of dexamethasone. This is preferred only for babies at very high risk of BPD. And we'll discuss which babies can get dexamethasone in the subsequent slide in the evolving phase. So here, if you see this graph, this is a very important graph, which will tell you at what phase of lung disease or what phase of uh, lung disease in the evolving phase of BPD, we should be giving steroids. On the x-axis, you have the risk of baby having uh, developing uh, BPD. On the y-axis, you have, if you give steroids, whether it will uh, prevent uh, death and B, uh, death and CP, or it will, work, it will increase the risk of having death or cerebral palsy. Now, as you can clearly see here, the cutoff appears to be at around 50%. After, if the risk of BPD is more than 50%, uh, giving steroid is likely to favor the patients by decreasing the risk of BPD and also by, uh, by decreasing death and CP. But however, if the risk of BPD is less than 50%, then giving steroids is not likely to favor the patients because it is increase, increasing the risk of having death or cerebral palsy. Uh, so the cutoff is 50%. If the risk of BPD is around 50 or more in the evolving phase, then there is a role of giving dexamethasone, uh, preferably low dose, but in some babies, maybe high dose also could be uh, acceptable. Now, how do we predict the risk of BPD in the evolving phase? The neonatal research network has come out with calculator. Here, you can, um, you can, um, uh, you can uh, jot the baby's gestational age, birth weight, the baby's gender, and uh, race or ethnicity. This is more applicable to the um, Western countries. So, but however, you can put a uh, black or uh, Hispanic or uh, white uh, in, in only three options are available here. And the age of the baby. So here I've taken 14 days as the baby and baby is on mechanical ventilation requiring FIO2 of 30%. So this is our baby now. And uh, we have a baby 26 weeker, 850 grams, girl child, requiring mechanical ventilation at 14 days with FIO2 of 30%. So once you press calculate, you get the risk of having death, BPD, moderate and severe, as well as mild and no BPD risk is given here. You can see here, this baby on day 14, if he's on FIO2 30% and requiring mechanical ventilation, there is a 9% risk of having death. 
there is almost 19% risk that baby will have severe BPD and this baby moderate BPD risk is about 30%. Mild BPD is 34% and no BPD is about 7%. So adding moderate to severe BPD and death, there is almost 70% 70 um, uh, chance that this baby is likely to develop into a um, BPD, uh, moderate to severe BPD or likely to die. So these baby could be a candidate for giving, uh, receiving dexamethasone. Because this baby, if you give dexamethasone, is risk of developing into a moderate severe BPD or death is going to come down. And also the baby may be benefited by having lesser risk of having cerebral palsy. As here, the risk is definitely more than 70-50%. Uh, now, after discussing the evolving phase, then comes the established phase. That is, the baby has required oxygen for more than 28 days. And at 36 weeks, the baby is on some respiratory support. And that means he's being labeled as bronchopulmonary dysplasia. And in these babies who have established BPD, um, one should screen for pulmonary hypertension because apart from treating lung disease, we need to work on improving the pulmonary vascular resistance and decreasing the pulmonary vascular resistance. So we need to look at pulmonary hypertension in these babies in the evolving as well as in the established phase. 25% of babies who have BPD are likely to have significant pulmonary hypertension. Um, the medicines which could be useful in the established phase are diuretics. Diuretics, you can give one or two trials of diuretic and see if the oxygen requirement comes down. You can continue with it. Thiazides are preferred over furosemide. And um, you can also look at uh, giving inhaled uh, um, bronchiolators like um, salbutamol only for those babies who have a wheezing, uh, wheezing or bronchospasm spells. Nutrition is a gold standard across the phases of uh, uh, BPD. And again, one should aim for um, one should aim for uh, calorie and protein intense uh, nutrition and avoiding fluid and overload and uh, at the same time avoiding overweight of the baby. Inhaled steroids again could be useful in few babies like inhaled butysonide could be useful in few of these babies to decrease inflammatory response in the airways. Uh, all these babies who are after in the established phase may benefit from uh, RSV and influenza prophylaxis before uh, uh, RSV prophylaxis before discharge and influenza prophylaxis could be given to the parents and to the family before discharge of these babies. So all there could be a cocoon vaccination of influenza could be done for all the family members before you discharge a BPD baby to home. Uh, tracheostomy in BPD babies is only required when the need for ventilation or the baby is on ventilation for more than 100 days. Now coming to the uh, nutritional aspect, nutrition is a core component of all phases of BPD and uh, early and aggressive parental nutrition and internal nutrition should be the focus in the early phase. We should aim for a 3.5 to 4 or 4.5 gram per kg per day of protein and calorie, require, calorie of 125 to 140 kilocalorie per kg per day. And always start by coating the cholesterol as early as possible because this is going to change the bioflora of the baby and maybe giving the friendly bacteria to the gut as well as to the oral cavity and prevent many subsequent infections. So every effort should be there to get the cholesterol of the mother on day one, on hour one and coat the baby's mouth and tummy with the cholesterol. And it has been shown that if you continue to use mother's own milk, it has a dose-dependent effect on decreasing the risk of having BPD. We'll look at this in the subsequent slide. And always aim for reaching full enteral feeds by day 7 or day, day 8. And in this full feed should be mostly mother's own milk or donor human milk. So we have a wonderful study coming from uh, Patel et al. Uh, where they have studied nearly 200 VLBW babies. Where they have shown that there is could be a 42% reduction in the risk of having CLD with increasing use of mother's own milk. Here, they have divided the VLBWs into four groups. The lower HM1 is the lower quantile of uh, mother's own milk and HM4 is where the total enteral nutrition, uh, nutrition was predominantly in the upper quantile of uh, upper quantile of mother's own milk. As the quantity of mother's own milk, you can see here, the risk of BPD is significantly reduced from 35% in the low dose of mother's own milk to 12% in the high dose of mother's own milk. So mother's own milk has a dose dependent effect on reducing the incidence of uh, chronic lung disease. It also has effect on late onset sepsis. So both could be contributed to each other. So it may be worth to work on this important intervention across all NICUs when you're treating extremely low birth and very preterm babies. There is a need for having a, a, a hospital grade breast pump and this should be accompanied by the mother right from birth or from the labor room till the mother is getting discharged from the hospital and or possibly at home too. 
So there is a need for having a dedicated lactation nurse for every NICU so that the mother's own milk is expressed and the support to the mothers is continued from admission till discharge and post-discharge so that babies continue to get exclusive mother's own milk. One needs to have every method to educate the staff on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that mother's own milk um, benefits are known to everybody and the quantum of milk is increased to given, uh, given to the baby is increased on a day-to-day -day basis. So one can have a dashboard at the entry of NICUs to ensure that they are working on mother's own milk on a quality improvement project on a day-to-day -day basis and decrease the risk of not only BPD but all other neonatal morbidities. This is a busy slide, but it shows the uh, evidence on the role of systemic uh, corticosteroids uh, in preventing BPD. So you can see here that in the early phase, the meta-analysis of randomized control studies using dexamethasone in the first early phase have shown definitely reduce the risk of having uh, uh, extubation failures, decreases BPD, decreases death or BPD. And however, it has no effect on home oxygen requirement, but it increases the chance of having cerebral palsy or death in the long term. So this is not a recommended therapy in the first one week. In the first one week, we don't want to give dexamethasone, although it decreases lung morbidities, increases neuromorbidities. Now, looking at the second aspect, that is the meta-analysis of randomized control trial, looking at dexamethasone after first seven days. This has shown to decrease the risk of having extubation failures, decreases the BPD, decreases death of BPD, decreases the requirement for home oxygen. And however, it doesn't have effect on uh, cerebral palsy or death on the long term. So it has a positive effect, but it does not have a negative effect on late onset septis and cerebral palsy on death on the long term. So after one week in select babies, we are, we can think of giving dexamethasone on a case by case basis. And looking at the early use of hydrocortisone, that is in the first one week, um, this is come from the single patient analysis of uh, RCTs using low dose hydrocortisone in the first one week and also looking at babies of 25, 26 weeks. Here you can see that the, uh, the babies on ventilation, there was no decrease in difference in duration of ventilation, but extubation prior to 10 days was better in babies who received hydrocortisone. Uh, the risk of BPD at 36 was lower. Uh, survival BPD, without BPD was higher. Uh, however, there was no effect on home oxygen, uh, cerebral palsy, or other neuromorbidities. Uh, you can see here, however, the risk of having late onset sepsis and spontaneous internal perfusion was significantly higher. And this risk was highest in babies less than 26 weeks and babies who are requiring endomethacin. So hydrocortisone, if it is given in the first one week, should be given only for babies less than 26 weeks at having uh, prenatal history of chorionitis and in the lowest dose possible and keep a watch on late onset sepsis and on SAP. But this risk is very high. And after one week, the hydrocortisone was used in a very high dose and this has not shown any effect on the risk of BPD and or on the long-term outcome. So no more hydrocortisone should be used after one week. Now coming to the last part of the presentation, what about the novel therapies? There's a lot of work coming up on the use of mesen and camel stem cells. Uh, this could work as improving the growth of the alveoli, growth of the uh, blood vessels, as well as improving the uh, airway uh, remodulation could occur with mesen and camel stem cells. There are some case reports and case series looking at improving the outcome of babies with, babies with BPD and using stem cell, uh, trans, uh, stem cell therapies. And one, as uh, many babies with BPD are likely to have pulmonary hypertension, we need to work on reducing pulmonary hypertension by working on uh, decreasing the um, production and effect of cyclic AMP, cyclic JMP, and also or increasing the levels of cyclic AMP and cyclic GMP and decreasing the effect of endothelin. So we all know to prevent endothelin uh, action, we can use bosentine. To increase the levels of cyclic AMP, we can think of using prostacycline, alprostadil, and mildenone. And to increase the levels of cyclic GMP, one can think of uh, NO and sildenafil and arginine as the methods. So inhaled nitric oxide in some studies have shown to be useful, but should not be a routine therapy. Insulin-like growth factor could be uh, used in future as a recombinant uh, medication uh, because babies who grow well are likely to have less chance of having BPD. So growth, improving growth could be a way of improving the insulin-like growth factor and decreasing the incidence and severity of bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So just to summarize, BPD is a disease of prematurity between 26 to 32 weeks. 
mostly, but it can happen in late preterms too. And uh, it is a disease which affects the blood vessels, alveoli, and the airways. <coughs> Definitions are evolving, but the current definition looks at the type of respiratory support at 36 weeks of postmenstrual age. BPD is not a, not a universal phenomenon in all preterm babies. It is more likely to happen in babies who are likely to be infected prenatal, postnatal, or have inflammation of the uh, lungs in the prenatal and postnatal period, or those babies who are risk are subjected to um, um, ventilated induced lung injury and oxygen trauma. Uh, management should be focusing on early phase within the first one one week, evolving phase between one week to thirty six weeks, and established phase after thirty six weeks of. Uh, PMA. Um, the, the, the main uh, therapy appears to be steroids, caffeine, nutrition, gentle ventilation, and non-invasive ventilation. These are the five uh, pillars of uh, uh, preventing or uh, managing babies, uh, extreme preterm babies to prevent as well as to manage babies with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. Thank you.